you look at the platform now, right? It's been running entirely without ESGMX emissions. It's all just been, you know, ETH rewards, which just kind of shows you how sustainable the platform is on its own. And being able to do that in a bear market is one of the underappreciated aspects of GMX's success. Because as we came onto the scene during the bear market, it kind of allowed us to very opportunistically take advantage of being first on the scene with an Arbitrum so that when the Arbitrum bull market came, right, we had all the ingredients to essentially just like ride that wave. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Edge podcast. I'm DeFi Dad, and I'm here with my colleague and co-host from Fourth Revolution Capital, Nomadic. In this episode, we'll cover the long-awaited release of GMX V2. GMX was a DeFi darling of the crypto bear market, having established itself as a breakout protocol for trading decentralized perps with leverage on Arbitrum. While centralized crypto finance experienced a nuclear meltdown in the face of FTX and Celsius, GMX injected hope that trustless decentralized perps would replace centralized exchanges once next generation L2s like Arbitrum can scale. Since 2022, GMX has powered over $140 billion in trading volume on Arbitrum and Avalanche. Today, we'll cover all of the added benefits, features, and enhancements made in GMX v2, so you as DeFi traders are armed with the information you need to get started. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Whether you're a trader, farmer, analyst, or newbie, you can trade smart with KyberSwap, the OG decentralized exchange and aggregator on 13 chains. Swap at the best rates, farm with real yields, set limit orders, use their proprietary trading and AI tools with the best UX in DeFi, securely and permissionlessly. Get better rates, better opportunities, better alpha, and a better trading experience. Trade smart now at kyberswap.com. Welcome to Mantle Network Mainnet. Mantle Network, the flagship product of Mantle Ecosystem, is a high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 network that brings scalability, security, and affordability to the forefront under a modular design. We're constantly growing and expanding. Since the launch of Testnet, Mantle Network has enabled a significant gas fee reduction for L2 transactions by up to 70% by adopting EigenDA technology. We also seamlessly integrated fraud proofs and concluded external audits on the code base. Together with its extensive ecosystem partners and hundreds of thousands of builders and community members, Mantle, powered by its native token, MMT, is committed to enabling the mass adoption of decentralized and token-governed technologies. You can now explore a multitude of projects already deployed on Mantle Network, from gaming to DeFi and beyond calling Web3 entrepreneurs to accelerate their project growth with the Mantle Grants program. The time is now. Join us to be part of the decentralized revolution. Hey everyone, my name is Kaido. I'm a co-founder at Utopia Labs. And today we're really, really excited to be announcing and launching a feature called USDC Bank Transfers. We're basically allowing for any company based anywhere in the world to be able to send USDC to any US bank account, whether that US bank account is a US citizen or a person who might have something as simple as a WISE account. If we zoom out since a year ago, there's been a chokehold on kind of the interoperability and seamlessness between traditional rails and crypto rails. We put a a lot of time and effort into this to be able to provide a smooth end experience for you as a consumer or as a company using crypto and using traditional financial rules. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts, and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains. In USDC. And native access to Instadap's powerful, custom DeFi strategies. Avocado. One wallet to rule all chains. All right, in just a moment, we'll introduce Fred, known as Fredegar Christensen, on Twitter. He is a BD contributor with GMX. Fred is ironically a crypto cynic who feels there is much more potential in DeFi, but also much more to be desired. Most importantly, Fred is optimistic that Arbitrum native protocols hold the power to realize the fullest potential within DeFi. 
with GMX leading the way. So let's kick it off. Fred, welcome to the Edge Podcast. Welcome back to a podcast that I host. How are you doing? Hello, hello, hello. What's up, DeFi Dad, Nomadic? Uh, it's always good to be on the, the Edge Podcast. I think it's been about almost a year now, right, since we last spoke, maybe like a month short of a year. Um, and I mean, so much has happened in the, the span of that time. I mean, what, like FTX is gone, but SBF might be here and bald token on base or something. What's up with that, right? Coinbase, right? Talking about an L2, um, Binance, Qcoin, cracking all under scrutiny. Gary, right? Making a scene. So it's all, it's all been a crazy year, but that's why we love the space, isn't it? Uh, well, the last time we talked, September 2022 preceded the fallout of FTX, but it, it also was after so many other terrible things had happened, uh, especially with like Celsius and other centralized crypto players. And uh, I think 2022, you know, while it was a super rough year for many parts of crypto, it was a defining year for GMX. It really proved uh, the need for decentralized perps. I think the category as a whole has grown so much because of the obstacles that GMX and others in this space um, stood up against. But just in case folks are new to GMX, we are going to dig into some of the fundamentals of GMX v1 just to help them get caught up. And then we'll talk all about uh, what really makes v2 uh, uh, such uh, a, a huge improvement over V1. Uh, but Fred, do you want to talk a little bit about like what led you to get involved in, in GMX and then anything else as a pseudo anonymous contributor that you're willing to share about your background? Yeah, definitely. So um, just to touch briefly on that first, first question, because I do think it'll be an interesting point later on. Uh, we did see some record volume and fees during the FTX meltdown. So we can talk about that later. But um, what drew me to kind of, you know, be involved with GMX was, um, you know, like I said, and I've told you guys before, you know, I'm a, I'm a crypto cynic or whatnot. So I was, you know, just kind of researching the, the space at the height of the yield farm hype, right? This is posts, you know, food farming at this point, right? We're talking, uh, this is like a uh, the Olympus Dow, right, um, hype narrative uh, period of crypto. And so I'm just, you know, I'm seeing all these rug pulls, all these, you know, failed attempts at uh, doing what Olympus Dow is trying to do, which I think, you know, what Olympus Dow themselves are trying to do is, you know, pretty great. But, um, you know, once you get the other ones doing it, so, you know, to try to replicate it, uh, you know, you have to do something interesting. And uh, just, just wasn't seeing that, right? That's that's kind of my thinking is, um, you know, if you want to do the next thing, it's like, you know, there's all these primitives and these fundamental, you know, uh, pieces of infrastructure that have been done. But um, that's kind of the thing, right? Like they're primitive, like we kind of have to move beyond them. And um, part of that is looking at them, you know, very squarely and seeing where they fall short and being like, you know, we need to address, address these issues. And I wasn't seeing that, you know, I was seeing people copy, paste, slap on, you know, X version of the same thing, you know, fish swap, tuna swap, whale swap, whatever you want to call it. And so um, eventually stumbled across what was not at the time as Gambit Finance. And it had a ridiculous yield And I'm thinking to myself, OK, this is another one of those farms, ridiculous yield, mercenary capital is going to rush in and out, yield's going to deflate, token is going to get sold off as it comes in. And, you know, it's going to be just another one of those stories. But um, the APR was interesting enough. That I'm like, you know, I'm going to hop into the to the Discord, talk, of, you know, see what, what's going on. And I prodded. And what was interesting to me was that the dev at the time, one man team X, right, legend, um, was very open to answering questions, didn't shy away from uh, criticisms, you know, critical, hard-hitting questions, and was uh, even open to accepting, you know, positive uh, feedback or suggestions. And to me, that was indicative of someone who was genuinely and earnestly trying to build something um, with the input of a community. And more than anything, right, that's probably where you want to start, right? If you're looking for something um, in a project that is cutting edge, right and making a difference like you want to look at the base component of that project which are the team members and for me right x 
his willingness to be open, his creativity, his uh, willingness to be transparent about where that creativity is coming from and the reasoning behind it uh, was very compelling for me. So I stuck with the project for a little bit, saw it evolve right before me. Like I said, this is all, it's very hard to talk about this experience because I don't know how common it is that people will stumble into a project, they find a developer at you know ground level and they kind of like take you on the journey with them as opposed to you know, showing up on this, you know, hey, I already got this thing built. I hope you like it. And if you have anything to say that's negative about it, I don't like you kind of thing, which is very common, I feel like. Um, so, yeah, that was um, the initial part of the journey, right, is uh, seeing this uh, one-man dev team kind of, right, being the community along with them. And when things got really serious and we started, and, and you know, X was talking about, oh, you know, I'm going to take Gambit from buying a smart chain over to Arbitrum on day one, and we're going to call it GMX. And we need some help, you know, who from the community wants to help. I just, you know, took the opportunity to kind of just, you know, heed the call, right, as a interested community member. Um, because I also felt like, right, it gave me a chance to kind of really give the, the edge to, um, you know, a DeFi project in a way that I thought was lacking, right? So I can talk about all these things that people can do afar or I can get involved, so. Yeah, honestly, Fred, that's like uh, one of those amazing success stories that I feel like sort of only crypto can offer. Um, just the fact that you're you're able to like hop into that Discord, talk to the lead, lead dev at such an early time and interact and interface and, and you know, kind of launch those hard questions at them. And, and like you said, it's a great sign when you're not met with hostility or you're not being accused of, you know, fudding and basically kicked out of the discord. Like, it, it's funny that we have to measure those things as like, you know, good factors, good indicators. Um, maybe maybe like before we dive into V2, let's, let's stay on GMX a little bit longer, GMX V1. And maybe in your words, like, why do you think GMX V1 was such a hit in DeFi. Um, and then for those like totally new to it, maybe you could just give a high level overview of the GMX architecture. Yeah. Um, so real quick and brief, um, I guess trigger warning, big words incoming uh, to make it brief. Um, GMX to me is a premier, right? On-chain uh, perpetual and swap decks. And what is unique about it is that instead of using either a centralized isolated order book, um, where, you know, you usually have to price um, the cost of liquidity into there, which can kind of introduce some inefficiencies. And unlike the typical decentralized uh, XYK automatic market maker model, which was uh, introduced and made popular by Uniswap, um, which is essentially kind of like a supply bound curve model right where um you have a pool essentially kind of create this uh supply and demand right um kind of feedback system um gmx and then and, and the in, it, issue with that right is um in permanent loss usually right and then severe uh price impact right if you want to enter a relatively small pool with size um so it's like you're restricted to just like whatever the liquidity that some random right you know, person is feeling incentivized to provide. Um, GMX kind of departs from both of those models uh, with a counterparty risk model. Uh, so GLP is, you know, the liquidity token. And unlike, a, you know, say Uniswap, where you have to provide liquidity um, with a balanced parity of, you know, both sides, right? You have to have, like, say, $500 of USDC and $500 of ETH, right, to provide a thousand dollars of liquidity, right, for uh, a Uniswap ETH USD pool. Um, with GLP on GMX V1, you just had to provide, you know, whatever whitelisted um, assets were within the pool of liquidity because it operated in like an index, and it was able to operate like an index because everyone at um, at the same time was essentially acting as the counterparty to the other side of trades, um, which is to say, um, GMX. Um, in totality kind of operates like a decentralized or disintermediated counterparty risk clearinghouse where um, liquidity is aggregated and large trades are able, able to be settled on a counterparty basis essentially 
Um, so it does mean that technically LPs are exposed to some risk in the event that traders are successful, but you know, the large of large, uh, the law of large numbers, excuse me, and, uh, the nature of, you know, investments on margin mean that most people tend to not necessarily be right. Uh, winning traders, um, in the large scheme of things, um, that's just like the nature of just trading with a large amount of risk. Right. Um, so. Um, it's an opportunity, right? And so that kind of um, is the flywheel of GMX, right? People are able to trade on chain margin, right? And with zero price impact because um, price of liquidity is kind of abstracted with um, price oracles instead, right? We don't have to use isolated liquidity to price the impact of a trade. We can just say, okay, you want to get, um, you know, 25 times leverage on the price of ETH at this point, we just pull that price right from a chain link price feed, as opposed to having to calculate also the cost of what that liquidity would be to provide that for you, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, and yeah, I think that that's generally how GMX works. Um, you know, for those who are kind of familiar with trash buy equivalents, right? Think of a centralized counterparty clearinghouse, um, something like the New York Stock Exchange, right? Is roughly, that's what that is. Um, but GMX is just that, but decentralized on chain and transparent instead of whatever the heck the New York Stock Exchange is. <laughs> I, I think what's really special about GMX, part, part of like my explanation for the growth of GMX in the face of like this like awful bear market was that folks want to speculate, they want to trade. And if you look at the bulk of economic activity and whatever you want to call traditional finance, it, it is mostly call it gambling. It's trading. Yes. Yeah, opportunity. And, and so, right. And so this, this was delivering on uh, a use case that had long been prophesied in DeFi that you'd be able to trade like you were on like a Binance or Coinbase with leverage by just connecting your, in this case, your Ethereum wallet, but you were able to enjoy the benefits of a of an L2 like Arbitrum with cheap fees and quick transactions, and so it was just like the perfect storm. And 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 I think it's unimaginable how much more, of course, you guys are going to grow in in the coming years here. But I I think it's it's a sign of just how insane that product market fit is for the decentralized perp space. Um, that was established here. So, you know, end of day, people want to trade, let them do what they want. They want leverage. They want to be able to, uh, they want to use a system that is trustless like GMX. Uh, and it's, it's just checking all those boxes. It's listening to users and delivering the product that they want versus like, I don't know, trying to shove real world assets down people's throats in DeFi, which is like a whole nother conversation. Yeah. I mean, real world assets will have their place for sure. And that, but I mean, I think part of the original appeal of DeFi, right, was to kind of get away from conventional, right, um, assetization of things the way that, right, just the conventional kind of way of doing finance, right? People wanted a little bit more access, a little bit more agency, right? Um, and so, in many ways, right, GMX is a peek into what that looks like for the uh, the perp context, um, right? Connect your wallet directly, uh, no KYC, right? No asking, you know, what your your life is. No asking for a picture of your face or anything like that. You know, just hook up your wallet, pick the markets you want to trade, and if you're curious about the liquidity, right, you want to know what did the books look like. Well, go ahead and go to the dashboard. Go to the Nansen AI dashboard. Go to any of the community-created dashboards. It's all on chain. You can see all the liquidity is fully backed. There's no threat of someone doing something goofy behind the, you know, a bunch of gray bureaucracy or anything like that. It's all it's all very straightforward right there. Um, and I think that's just the, like you said, it's the magic of it. Plus, um, Arbitrum is just. I don't think GMX would, for instance, run as smoothly on mainnet both as a matter of the Oracle price feeds, right? Giving reliable price data or as a matter of the very complex code base being um, gas efficient, right? It probably costs, not even exaggerating, probably $10 just to like claim rewards, right? If GMX were like on mainnet or something. Fred, I want to just quickly bring it back to something you said earlier. It kind of struck me uh, that GMX launched September, 2021 
that was like the last legs of what was an incredible bull cycle. Um, so, so essentially like GMX, most of its existence has been in what we call, you know, the bear market. Like how much of GMX's success do you think was attributed to launching in the bear? And then also like when I think back, it, it's probably one of the most successful uh, performing tokens uh, in, in the bear market as well. Like how do you, how do you, how do you think about all that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Cause I think it allows me to kind of showcase, um, maybe like one of the design principles about GMX, which I think is incredibly successful. So yeah, we launched, uh, 2021 September, I believe, um, almost two years ago now, um, right day one with Arbitrum and it was indeed a bear market in that period. Um, but because it was a bear market, what I think that gave us the opportunity to do was to validate a very compelling product concept to the most hardcore audience of crypto um, native users, right? The people who do stay during a bear market, um, which kind of built this very sticky, very organic very involved base of both liquidity users, community members who were willing to do, you know, um, create, you know, bots to give people information about positions, about available liquidity, right. To just give people more information about the platform and think about different ways of using it. Um, and essentially, right. It allowed us to show that GMX is a product that is inherently incentivize right which is good probably because all the all other projects before now even still kind of operate on the basis of like oh we have to issue out this token to incentivize people to use it and what that implicitly is saying without saying it out loud is that oh our product is not compelling enough on its own right i don't understand right as a crypto cynic right i don't understand why we have not moved past that kind of logic it doesn't make any sense to me that people are going out here and be like, oh, like I have this product, I need to incentivize you to use it. It's like, why is your product not compelling enough on its own, right? Like no one pays me to use the branded peanut butter I like. They just got me, right? They just know what I like. And the incentive is that I like that kind of peanut butter and I, I'm a fan of peanut butter, right? So um, with GMX, it's like, you think about it again, like as a flywheel, right? Like what's the starting point of the flywheel? a compelling user experience for traders, right? Zero price impact, transparent uh, funding, whatever, right? So yeah, users start using the platform, right? Volume goes up. When the volume goes up, what does that mean? It means that stake GMX and stake GLP start to get a compelling APR, which compels them to either remain staked or to even increase their positions for those respective um, staking situations. Um, and that in turn, right, either reinforces, say, um, the commitment behind the conviction of the GMX platform, or it um, right um, increases the thickness and the stickiness of the liquidity which traders are reliant upon. Right, and so if we have users coming to the platform because it's a compelling user experience, and that creates a lot of volume, and that a lot of volume creates a lot of fees, which in turn create um, more stakeholders in the platform, or it creates um, stickier and more um, thick liquidity, then we're able to right, to accommodate a higher capacity of traders, right? Traders who want more leverage, right? Who want to enter more sides, which creates more volume and it, go, you know, so on and so forth, right? It's like the product is itself inherently um, incentivizing, right? Um, of course, um, as a new product, right? Um, you do need a way to kind of compel people, right? Um, attention towards your, your platform. Um, and so there was the initial ESGMX emissions that we had, right? Um, and even that, right, was designed with um, a sustainable um, approach, right? Um, escrow GMX, I think, might have been one of the first kind of tokens to take that escrowed approach um, to the way that it did, right? I think it's a innovation on the top of the uh, initial vesting model, I think, curve might have introduced or popularized. But... Um, yeah, you look at the platform now, right? Um, and even before we got to this point, I think it's been like three months now, maybe a little bit longer. There, it's been running entirely without ES GMX emissions. It's all just been, you know, ETH rewards, um, which just kind of shows you how sustainable the platform is on its own. Um, and being able to do that in a bear market is what I think the 
is one of the underappreciated aspects of GMX's success because as we came onto the scene during the bear market, it kind of allowed us to very opportunistically take advantage of being first on the scene with an Arbitrum so that when the Arbitrum bull market came, right, we had all the ingredients to essentially just like ride that wave. And not only do we ride that wave, I feel that we are still essentially able to float on top where most other tokens or projects, if you just like at their price alone, right, are not even treading water, right? A lot of them are underwater at this point, right? Not to say anything, you know, about them as a business, right? I'm just talking about like how the graphs look. I, I have to say in like going over all the product market fit of GMX V1, I don't know if, if anybody could as eloquently tie it back to peanut butter and, and types of peanut butter they like, but like you're speaking my language now, you know to relate kind of complex topics back to food. So now, now I think I understand. <laughs> I'm glad. I think we should maybe just address some of the shortcomings or, or if you view them as shortcomings to GMX V1 or some of the design makeup that maybe kept some of you up at night or still does. Um, and, and that'll kind of segue us into like, why you went about building v2 yeah no that's a that's a great question um i would say that there were maybe two or three main problems just in general with um the trajectory of gmx so the first i would say so yeah i would just stick with that and so the first would be um with zero price impact it made it so that you know large sides traders who you know, they get in at a really good opportunity. Um, they can just park their capital there for like a long, long time. And because of that, um, it can over time kind of take up uh, trading capacity. Um, so that means two things. It means one, it can lead to a skew in the open balance, which isn't necessarily um, a bad thing. But when you have to have risk hedging parameters right to uh, ensure that LPs are protected um, and those risk hedging parameters look like having trading capacities um, if you know people over time are able to park large positions that means um, without liquidity opening up or the open interest skewing a little bit more balanced um, it means that if someone else wants to open a long right say on ETH but lo ETH long capacity is tapped out right they can't do that or they have to settle for doing a smaller position right and that starts to put a dent in the uh, the user experience that was supposed to be so great in the first place, right? Uh, so that's uh, one of the first problems um, that we kind of like ran into. But it, it's a good problem because it means that demand is high, right? It just means like right now that demand is um, almost outsizing the product's capability to handle it at the moment, right? Uh, which is a good thing, right, if addressed correctly. So I would say it's like a growing problem that we ran into. But the uh, second uh, part of that was, um, in general, you do want, right, as um, the point, the nexus point of, right, um, a DEX, right, you do want, ideally, a balanced open interest. Um, because a balanced open interest means that you're having um, your liquidity fully utilized as opposed to having capital that's sitting idle and not being productive. Right, because then that's um that's just lost opportunity costs, both for LPs and uh for the platform as a a venue right to allow for trading. Um, so that was like the first problem was open interest and uh, trading capacity being taken up by traders. But it was a good again, it was a good problem. It was people seeing that they could um uh, right get this really neat user experience, um, of opening up a large size position and not having any price impacts right affect the uh the entry of the position. So that was the first one. Um, the second problem was that um, as a kind of like DeFi Lego, GLP, oh, um, which it, it, it's both great as a DeFi Lego, right? There's so many protocols that were able to utilize it. Um, but if you wanted to do something like Delta Neutral Hedge GLP or Beta Hedge you know, GLP or something like that, as a index token all right of a composite of many assets and not just a composite of many assets but also a composition of the pending 
P&L and fees, right, of those assets, it was a lot of noise, which made it very hard to do higher level financial strategies on top of, um, which kind of, in a sense, um, stemmed the extent to which GLP integration or derivatives could grow. Um, and, you know, we were kind of talking about this earlier in the show, right? Um, Umami, you know, finance, you know, great team. Um, even with you know, all their resources, you know, they had to kind of take their USDC, right, Delta Neutral vault back to the drawing board, um, which, you know, kudos to them for being able to come back to that. Um, and, you know, that, you know, that was, um, you know, they weren't the only people or the only project, right, that I ran into that issue. It's a very common thing that we heard, um, you know, Rage Trade for, you know, whoever's been following Rage Trade, right, has um, taken a very careful approach to, uh, you know, their Delta Neutral strategy because it's just so much noise to go through. It's, um, I think, almost seven or eight assets in in the the GLP pool. And then on top of that, right, it's pending PNL for all each of those assets. It's just a lot to kind of calculate all at once and on chain too. Um, so part of the issue was also just GLP, um, the composite nature of it was just something that I guess maybe a more accurate way to put was just like DeFi wasn't yet ready to fully utilize or handle it yet. Um, and um, maybe also just it's uh, one of those things that's almost like maybe it's just um, the nature of like uh, a you know a DeFi index. It's just um, you know it's very great for like base basic hedging, right? Having a um, an asset uh, portfolio that's already kind of like allocated and hedged for you. But in terms of delta nu- nu- neutralizing that, right, it becomes a little bit more difficult. And maybe that's just how that will always be. Who knows? But um, the move away from that was something that we had to consider. Um, it also meant that it would be easier to balance uh, open interest, right? So we got open interest issues, trading capacity issues as part of the open interest, and then building on top of GLP. And then I would say following that um, is the general kind of systematic issue of um, you hit um, technological limits, kind of like the ones that we're already talking about now, and that inhibits your ability to accommodate more volume and if right our flywheel is based on the ability to accommodate increasing levels of volume um, then we need to figure out how do we um how do we how do we increase that right so it's looking at things like user experience where we fall short on the user experience compared to centralized exchanges right um, one of those being um the ability to customize um orders right with uh, parameters like uh take profit stop loss you know triggers um these are things you can do on gmx v1 but you have to edit afterwards right you have to edit your position after opening it very clunky in regards to that for user experience um the other is um just the charts right they want you know charts with more granular price updates um something that's hard to do with just you know decentralized on-chain price feeds because on-chain is sometimes kind of slow and if you're doing a lot of data, right, or a lot of price updates, right, that can uh, lead to congestion, that can lead to throughput issues. So I would say those those are the main issues facing GMX V1. But they were all good issues, I would say. They were issues indicative of a platform growing and meeting um, the limits of its uh, ability to meet the demand. I think this, this background segues us into all of the benefits, the features of V2. Like, you have to understand where we're coming from with V1 and, and those shortcomings you just called out to really understand the impact of, uh, of V2. So the TLDR on GMX V2, if I was going to summarize it uh, into just a few bullet points, um, first off, you have new markets available, um, which is exciting because we were limited by GLP to add new markets in V1. Um, we have multiple collateral types then. And then we've got faster execution times, which I'll let Fred explain more about that. And uh, it essentially is like less in terms of the fees, whether you're swapping or whether you're opening up a leveraged position. And and I would encourage folks, if you go to the GMX app, uh, you you don't have to execute a trade. You can just, you know, enter in the details, enter the same trade into V1 versus V2, and you will, you know, quickly notice that there's, there's a pretty big difference in terms of the amount of fees that you're going to pay. Um, so Fred, could could we start then with uh, 
Let's talk about the GM isolated pools. Uh, can you just explain like what these are, how they they work at a high level, and, and how they differ from GLP? Yeah, definitely. So um, as I was saying earlier, GLP is a composite index. So just think of your regular stock indexes, right? A collection of stocks represented under one. Uh, GLP is the same, a uh, bunch of tokens under one. Um, and like I said, that was a lot of noise, um, hard to kind of, you know, parse through sometimes, but, um, on basic level, a great hedge, um, GM, uh, pools allowed us to both offer more markets because we didn't have to worry about the, the risk of say like a high, um, tail risk asset like Doge or Ripple, right. Um, tainting the, uh, price integrity of. Uh, the GLP index or an index in general, right? Those are very volatile assets. Um, they're fun to trade, right? But maybe not fun to hold necessarily, or you don't want them right necessarily in the portfolio. And if you do, you're more than welcome to have them now in your portfolio. But um, it allowed us to, right, introduce more tail end risk assets. And it also um, allowed us to essentially offer more efficient pricing on the liquidity specifically because it was now isolated. Um, in many ways you could think of GLP not having price impact and being a bit more expensive as kind of like compensating for that, like lack of pricing of liquidity, right? Whereas like now that we're isolating some of that liquidity, um, we're able to more efficiently price it, which means uh, making it actually a little bit more cheaper. Um, and that's why you're seeing higher utilization rates. Um, but yeah, they're isolated pools. Um, and so for whatever on-chain asset for Arbitrum, um, right, that market will be that on-chain asset plus USDC. Um, and then for any uh, markets where there is no native liquidity, it's essentially just ETH in USDC, where ETH acts as a proxy for that asset. And yeah, users as LPs can selectively, you know, choose different kinds of risk exposure they can do all USDC on the ETH USD market. Um, if they want, you know, to be a little bit more uh, degen and they want the fees, they can do, you know, ETH on the Doge markets. Um, it's all very composable and flexible. Um, and that was kind of the the idea of it, right? Is um, making it more composable and flexible means more efficient pricing on liquidity. And it also means, right, uh, more opportunity to fine tune your exposure as an LP. So. Uh, that was for me the the major changes for for GM uh, tokens or markets. I just want to quickly highlight in terms of those GM pools, and I will we will probably end up uh, sharing uh, a screenshot of those if folks watch this on YouTube later. Uh, those rates have been you know relatively high, and so we're still in a beta stage of GMX V two, but just. As of today, and, and again, forgive me, I'm sure whatever I show on screen here when we edit this all together, uh, but I'm like, I'm looking at rates that are around like 12% APR for the ETH GM pool, 13% for Bitcoin, uh, as high as 20%. This is uh, on August 14th, 2023 for the uni pool. So these are pretty compelling yields for someone who wants to earn with just that asset. And this is a huge step forward compared to what all of us understood as the GLP composite model, where we had to, you know, accept the fact that we were essentially exposed to all these other assets. And um, it, it created some really interesting uh, opportunities to, to like hedge against the downside. But at the end of the day, like this to me is, this is going to allow these different markets to, uh, I think, meet the the demand of traders who want more liquidity for uh, ETH and they want more liquidity for, uh, as of today, it looks like Link is a really popular market, uh, Wrapped Bitcoin is a really popular market. So, um, and we can add more pools. So, you know, just to reiterate the most obvious here, now we don't have to worry about uh, having an effect on this GLP model that was in V1, where I think it was, Fred, would you say, I mean, I mean, that's a pretty fragile, delicate situation to have no, added it, it is. more tokens. It, it could have been, uh, you know, 
a vector for attack or or for someone to you know potentially rack the GLP? No, absolutely. Um, I mean, part of it is um, you know everything in terms of adding new tokens to GLP would have had to go through governance anyway, and that means that any additional you know asset to the portfolio right would have to go through you know deliberation and that means there's going to be on one side right the people who are you know stringent on the current composition of glp because right maybe they're risk adverse and they don't want to add any more noise to the portfolio and of course you have the people who maybe aren't thinking about so much the composition of the portfolio as more they're thinking of oh this will you know introduce more volume which will mean more fees and it's like all right but at the cost of what tanking the price of GLP, which is partly why people are attracted to it and why um, the liquidity stays for so long. Um. So yeah, it was it was one of those very tricky. And it was funny because early on, it, for you know any OG GMX followers in the the audience, you know they might have remembered one of the original government's uh, proposals that was going up was to add some tokens very early on to GLP to increase the assets so that, you know, there could be more volume. But some of those tokens included what we thought at the time were very sound projects like Sushi and Curve, but look at them now, right? Um, I think at the time that we were thinking about adding Sushi, it was like maybe six, maybe it was ranging between like five to seven dollars. I think it's not less than a dollar, right? And I'm going to have to speak about what's going on with Curve now. We all know what's going on there, right? Uh, hopefully, you know, that issue kind of resolves itself, but goes to show you that in many ways right not uh right just like not doing that was a, a good decision in the long run you know what i mean um but now gm pools gives us the ability to introduce those pools relatively uh risk-free right and so whoever does want to be exposed to that risk maybe because they more are interested in the volume and the yield than they are the price exposure uh can you right theoretically do that more easily than before um and it also means um from the protocol side right if the protocol wants to add more markets it's also just easier to do that um than before without having to disrupt other people's um you know pre-existing positions for instance fred i want to talk next about the fee structure for v2 um we know that traders are very sensitive when it comes to fees and it's really like an important part of the whole protocol one one element that was missing from v1 was a lack of a funding rate i believe and this is now introduced in v2 i don't want to get like too into the weeds but maybe maybe keep it high level and if people really want to dive into the fee structure castle capital went very deep on this and wrote an amazing report um that i read before this 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 chat but um highly recommend people check that out but but yeah, maybe Fred, give us like the the TLDR on the fee overhaul here. Yeah, so the main difference um, for the fee change is that um, the fees were effectively just allowed to be lowered, right? There's obviously still like open and close fee. Um, there's, you know, borrowing rate, um, but there's now also price impact. And so in many ways, kind of like that price impact um, is... If you, you want to think about it, it's kind of um, encapsulates what would have been a lot of the initial fees in B1, um, right? So with price impact um, and kind of more efficient pricing of the liquidity because it is isolated, um, things like opening and closing fees are more able to be lowered because price impact, right, um, puts that cost on liquidity and kind of um, tightens up utilization, which means more capital is more... Uh, efficiently used at all times whereas with a GLP again with the trading caps right there was at times say um, maybe only 75 million of ETH liquidity being traded and then like 100 just kind of like sitting idle there not doing anything right not generating any fees or anything like that um, the fee structure means that uh, the immediate liquidity that's there can be more immediately utilized um, at a cheaper rate so people can also right open up smaller positions with higher leverage more frequently which is uh, the behavior that we're starting to see which is interesting and um, a positive um, divergence from the uh, more older behavior we were seeing which is uh, you know larger wallets parking uh, large positions and just like staying there and that's kind of just like what it was for a long time which again not necessarily bad but we hit our growth you know 
uh, limits with that kind of model. Um, with this, right, like I said, we're seeing uh, small positions with higher leverage being opened up. So that means um, in many ways uh, more liquidations, which is great for LPs, um, but are also seeing um, higher volumes, um, higher fees for LPs, even though rates are cheaper right on the trader side, um, which is really interesting. Um, and then with the dynamic funding rate, right, we're seeing things like I was trying to tell you guys before where like people are able to do things like park a doe short and then earn something like, uh, or maybe I think if so, if you go in one of the community channels, someone's created this really neat bot that shows the funding rates spread out over, you know, 365. So you can see what they are as APY. And I think Litecoin shorts right now get like a 644% APY. So like, you know, you really, you're really bullish on the Litecoin short, or I guess bearish on Litecoin in general, right? Uh, park the Litecoin short or 644% APY on that. And, uh, you know, go to town or something like that. Not financial advice. I'm just talking about publicly available figures here. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, right. That's the, that is the beauty, right. Of the innovation. Um, so I'm just hoping that more people can kind of find out about that, start to play around with it and uh, just really take advantage of uh, the more efficient pricing for liquidity. That's that's really cool to see the community jump on that so quickly. Um, what So one other thing I just want to highlight too, and I, I don't know if this is checked out kind of on your side, but in that Castle Capital report that I referenced, they did a few uh, kind of like analysis of different uh, trades and kind of came to the conclusion that V2 looks like it could be 60% cheaper according to some of the simulations they ran through, um, which which is phenomenal. And and then just another thing I want to point out too, that um, with, with like this funding rate addition, essentially dominant direction, dominant direction traders now pay minority direction traders. Um, I think that's, that's cool. Like essentially like now, you know, contrarianism is rewarded. Whereas before, everybody could just pile into the consensus trade and not really be penalized for it to some degree. Like, and, and and like this, this kind of brings us back to that whole thing we've been talking about, that theme of like balancing the open interest and just balancing the protocol in general. And then not, you know, I think that was also like, um, like an attack vector a little bit on the GLP, like not an attack vector, but, but essentially traders could be very profitable in, in certain bull market scenarios without this balancing uh, factor here. So um, it looks like it's addressing a lot of the um, issues that we've already talked about from from V1. What you're describing is um, kind of like the behavioral phenomenon we're seeing with V1, which is like, um, if there's momentum in one direction, right? Like if everyone, everyone was like bullish on ETH, right? When it touched like 1600, right? So it's like, everyone's going to go along, right? If they can on GMX, right? On ETH at that point, um, because the cost to do so is very low right um and right that means that glp whenever those people exit their trades um right is going to take a decent decent hit in terms of its aum right as people you know take their profits and those profits get taken out of glp aum um i don't even think that that's just an example um but yeah that that uh that trader momentum i guess you want to call it, or open interest momentum was one of the bigger issues on um, GMX and so um, with a you know dynamic funding right now um, and you know one side essentially going you know going to pay the minority skew as you were saying it allows for I guess what you can call like fee arbitrage where it's like if you see an opportunistic trade against the majority opinion right and you think it's not just a profitable trade but you see an, a platform now um, incentivizing you with a positive funding rate to take up that position you know, like, why would you not take up that position, right? And that's what GMX allows. And so, um, obviously, in general, right, the market will obviously take a momentum, you know, one direction or another. But GMX has now introduced this window of opportunity for opportunistic trades in the opposite direction, where, you know, if you see a great opportunity, contrary to, you know, general consensus, you can take that now and be rewarded to do so. So not only do you make a profitable trade in the situation, maybe, but now you're being rewarded for opening up that position and holding it in the meantime, um, which I think was what was missing from V1. Fred, there, there's just two more major points we want to call out in terms of uh, the advancement of V2. Uh, one of those is, uh, you know, I'll just say it's multiple collateral types. And 
One example given in one of the GMX blog announcements was uh, uh, a 0.1 ETH position can be opened with one ETH of collateral for a low cost and low leverage ETH long. Can you just dumb down the significance of this? And I guess, how does this differ from V1? Yeah, so essentially with how V2 is set up, um, users now can enter um, positions with collateral of their choice, whereas like before with V1, they had to, like on the back end, the collateral swapped out for depending on what side you took. So shorts, if you took um, like an ETH, BTC, Uniswap, or Link short on V1, on the back end, right, your collateral swapped out for stables. And if you did a, um, a long, right, say you, you use ETH as collateral for like a BTC long, on the back end, what happens is that ETH collateral gets swapped for a BTC equivalent amount, and then the long is opened, right? Um, with V2, you're now actually able to open your position with the collateral in question. So that means if you think that there is a, you know, you, you think you hit the pico bottom of Ethereum and you want to go long on, you know, Ethereum with not too much leverage because you want to give yourself a wide range of room in terms of like liquidation parameters, right? Because obviously higher um, leverage, higher, you know, liquidation parameters. Um, you can do that and essentially ride the, the directional wave of ETH price appreciation, both in your collateral and on your, your leverage. Uh, like, whereas before, um, that wasn't entirely the case. Um, and that means if you want to take that ETH log in USDC, you can also do that, right? And that uh, might be more attractive to some people who are going to have like a, a locked in dollar denominated position, whereas like before they couldn't do that, their position would be like ETH denominated, which meant, right, it would fluctuate. Um, so this also means if, um, say you're bullish on like Doge or like Litecoin, you take a, you know, position in ETH collateral while, you know, ETH is also at its bottom and, you know, Litecoin is at its bottom, you then ride the appreciation in your collateral and the appreciation of the price of Litecoin, um, which again, wasn't something that you could do before, right? Um, both because we didn't have Litecoin markets, um, but also because GLP was a composite, right? Liquidity pool and whatnot. So all these possibilities are unlocked in this you know, it's a really, it's just really neat opportunities. Um, and how those things are managed, you know, you can read the docs if you like auto deleveraging and things like that to manage, right? Um, collateral, which is also kind of like moving relative to the price of the market, right? It's trading on and things like that. But um, yeah, it opens up so many more possibilities. Um, and that's just what V2 was all about, right? It was increasing the amount of possibilities that users could kind of tap into and, um, you know, we anticipate that that will, you know, translate into more volume. Um, okay. So lastly, w one of the biggest uh, uh, innovations, improvements here to V2 is uh, we have faster execution times. It's related to the fact that I guess uh, Chainlink is providing uh, a brand new low latency Oracle. Can you dumb down that for us? Like at the end of the day, like what does this all mean? How do we get to faster execution times? The faster execution times are tied both to the chilling price feeds and also how uh, orders are handled on chain by the GMX uh, protocol. Um, so it all starts though with the the chilling price feeds. Um, so currently, how chilling price feeds work is I believe they're deployed on main mainnet the the main price feed or Oracle nodes, and essentially, um, right off chain data is brought on chain to mainnet, and then all the price feeds for L2s are basically um, oracles, which the message between mainnet and that L2, uh, which means it's very slow, right? There's lag, there's latency in between that communication on different networks or whatnot. Um, and that makes uh, chain pricing, while uh, reliable in terms of like, you know, you're going to get a trusted, you know, on tamper with price feed, um, it's going to be very slow. Um, and therefore, not ideal for the uh, margin trading experience. Um, with these uh, updated Chainlink price feeds, um, I believe what they essentially do is they take more periodic or frequent. And mind you, I'm not part of the Chainlink team. I don't, you know, I don't know how these work, so like I'm not 
stating anything definitive here. I'm just understanding my, I'm communicating my layman understandings of it. Is that um, they essentially um, more frequently update the price information and they're able to bypass either the cost or the, uh, the throughput hurdles of messaging between L1s and L, uh, L1 mainnet and L2s. And on the GMX side, that allows us to essentially get more frequent price updates and to allow um, those frequent price updates to be um, earmarked essentially in a two-step transaction process so that when you make your your trade, right, the little time in between interacting with your Web3 wallet and the front end, you know, just like loading all the information for you to press, you know, confirm and all that, and the time when it executes on-chain, the price of execution is stored already on-chain so that you can execute at that price, essentially. I believe it's essentially a combination of um, messaging efficiency between mainnet and L2s, um, more granular and frequent price updates, and a two-step transaction process, which allows us to uh, more accurately take advantage of that frequent price updating on chain. So GMX V2 is currently in beta. Can you maybe walk us through what guardrails, if any, are present in the beta launch? And then I'd be curious, like what it looks like coming out of beta. And then I don't know if I'm making this up, but uh, I thought I saw that uh, V2 beta launch is already launching with more allowable open interest than even V1 offered. Did I see that correctly or did I just totally make that up? I'm not sure because I'm not sure if that means like allowable open interest during launch or in general. Um, but no, 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 I, I'm just not entirely, I'm just not entirely sure. Um, I do want to say that technically, I, I mean, with V1, when we first launched, there were, um, much more stringent, um, risk hedging parameters for the LP to protect LPs, obviously, which meant like lower trading capacities. Um, there was, um, like a time lock for minting and burning GLP back in those days. Cause you know, we didn't want mercenary capital in and out of an actively traded composite pool. Um, there was also like way, 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 way early back. I think there was like a time lock on positions for GMX way back in the day. So maybe that's what they might be referring to is like all those things that were initially, you know, kind of like just a necessity of being like a very early project on Arbitrum back when like there was nothing going on on Arbitrum. So like nowadays you're like, we can launch a V2 product and not need those restrictions as much. So not necessarily sure if that's what it's referencing, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone was like talking about it. I mean, I, I would say it's a great show of progress to be able to, you know, launch a V2 product without needing the same safety, you know, uh, guardrails around it as you needed for V1. Um, right now, we are just limited by just like the liquidity available. So anyone out there who wants, you know, juicy yield and is, you know, looking for a new place to park some capital, you know, consider the GM pools and their very interesting rates. Um, again, not financial advice just letting you know what the ecosystem looks like out there but um yeah i don't think there are really any guardrails it's just i think there might have been talks of increasing leverage eventually from uh on the the front end ui from like 50 to 75 times or something like that um because i think technically technically like at the code base level there is capacity for like higher leverage it's just not accessible on the front end or something like that um but no, I don't. I don't think there are any guardrails in the same way that we had them for the first time around, uh, which was even before I was a BD contributor. Well, Fred, this is a great place for us to start to wrap up. I want to remind our listeners that they should uh, follow you on Twitter. So this is Fredigar Christensen, or we call him Fred on Twitter. It's at zero x Fred Chris. Uh, and then you should, of course, follow GMX there at GMX underscore IO. And most important, you should go to GMX.io. Uh, they also have this awesome stats page, which I think speaks to, you know, just the success, the product market fit that's been established by GMX. Um, and like as of this recording, uh, I, I believe they've done collectively around 140 billion in total trade volume since like early 2022 maybe it was start of 2020 or 
end of 2021. Uh, but Fred, I want to give you the final word then, you know, as always, just thanks for coming to talk with us. Uh, this is like such a, a, a fun conversation to talk about a product that, uh, you know, we're familiar with as users and, and we see as like just a mega sector of DeFi. Like this is a sector of DeFi that in my opinion is incredibly undervalued. It's going to grow exponentially in whatever market, but hopefully there's a bull run right around the corner. Uh, but yeah, Fred, anything else that you can share or anything else you're excited about in terms of the roadmap in the next like six to 12 months? I would first just say thank you guys for hosting. Always a pleasure being on the Edge podcast, DeFi Dad Nomadic. Always love talking to you guys. Um, for those who want to follow GMX closer, uh, feel free to check us out on Discord and Telegram. Uh, I like to think that we have one of the closer communities in the DeFi space. Join, ask questions, ask for help. Careful scammers though, but you know, we're more than happy to help answer questions. Um, and um, yeah, if you're curious about what's on the roadmap, um, generally speaking, we've been saying this for a while now, like after V2, what we would love to see next is like a, a chain expansion. So keep an eye out for that, right? GMX is a great product and we'd love for people who are, you know, um, dedicated to other you know, networks to experience what we got to offer. So um, that's something that we're looking at next. But um, other than that, just I uh, really appreciate you guys hosting us, giving us this time to just talk about what we've got going on. And if you guys are curious, you know, for the audience, if you're curious about uh, what it's like to use GMX, you know, feel free to head out over there, uh, gmx.io. And if you'd like, you can use, you know, my discount code to go ahead and, you know, get a discount while you're using GMX. It's just my Twitter handle, uh, 0xfredkush, capital F, capital C. And uh, yeah, go ahead, check it out, see what it's, you know, everyone's, you know, raving about. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod. Mm -hmm.